mainly the best that I've been able to find and praise you down on the Metcalf name and uh, focusing on, on my namesake because I'm James Arthur Metcalf. Uh, my namesake are my great great grandfather, some of your great 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 grandfather. I don't think there's any great 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 great. <laughs> and uh, what he did, and, and then I'll kind of take it through a little bit about my family, how that came down to my family, and then I'll be done. And my son Andrew is here, and Andrew has said, when I've talked too much, he'll go. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Um, <laughs> Nakalo has, has some history in the, in the family name, and it surfaces a couple times, but it, it goes back to the Yorkshire, Northern England border with Scotland. And the definition, and it's sort of a many definitions I've seen, but Nakalo is, is kind of a definition of rolling hills or moors and that kind of a, a environment. So that's why I call it the Nakalo Heritage. And I'm actually struggling to write a book on all of this, and this PowerPoint has helped me uh, focus my thinking a lot. So I call it that. And a journey from Dentdale to uh, Toronto and beyond. Um, Dentdale is where we, and others, and by the way, this I feel like the student talking to the teachers because. Mary Jane probably knows ten times about the Metcalf family than I do. But anyway, well, hopefully together we'll conspire and, and uh, see if I can do this right now. Yeah. Um, whoops, I can't do that. Go back and forth. Okay. Um, so origin of the name, I'm sure a lot of you have seen a lot of this, but when you go back in the research, you find the name spelled many, many ways, and we now know it's spelled many ways. And the best that I can find in the record is the name was recorded in Dentdale, the William Metcalf of Dent. Um, what does it mean? Um, definitions, but it meat means food, meat means meadow, calf means calf. So put all those together and you, you have a Metcalf. I'm going to try and stay out of the way. Calf farm. <laughs> so the family originated um, somewhere up in this Dentdale border area in Scotland and England and quickly settled in a, in a village around the village called Asprey and um, uh, in Yorkshire. Um, and we, Valerie and I were there four years ago. I think some of you have been there. Bruce, you've been there, I think, haven't you? You've been there? And uh, so it's, if you go to the cemetery there, it's Metcalf, 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 Metcalf in the, in the cemetery. And we went into a little coffee, tea shop and had coffee and I said, hi, I'm a Metcalf. And she said, are you one of the wealthy ones or one of the poor ones? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot, uh, and Earl got me going in this one on the family crest. And if you if you go online, there's probably 30 or 40 family crests that you'll find. And uh, I, I've since learned, that, according to the literature, that there's no such thing as a family crest. That every individual is actually given a crest. So a lot of what you see in terms of family crests. Is, uh, Apparently, is more commercializing of the family crest. But this is the best that I can come up with as a, an example of the Metcalf family crest. And let's go with it. And for those of you that have the ring, and I guess most of you do, or have seen it or have it, and uh, keep keep it going. By the way, I just uh, I have nine grandchildren. Valerie and I have ten, but I have nine uh, from my side of the family. And I've just gone out and ordered the nine pieces so they they can all uh, have their uh, their ring. Or, or a bracelet, whatever they want. But that's the uh, that's the crest that I kind of work with as the family crest. So Asbury, this is the village. Uh, the family settled there in the 1400s. There's all kinds of literature about the family and how famous it was and what they did and their their role. And they were actually a pretty prominent family. But tracing it down, there's a little piece that. Uh, James Metcalf, who fought in the Battle of Asian Court in 1415, he was rewarded with a large piece of land in the Aspen area. Um, and in, in 1450-59, his son Thomas built Napa Hall. And I think some of you have visited Napa Hall. Uh, this is a recent picture. We went there in, again in 2010 and uh, toured around the property. What seemed to be a bad has just been sold, and somebody is renovating it. I don't let them worry about it. This is the and there's all kinds of stories of what Mary Queen of Scots stayed there for two days while she was imprisoned and traveling around. There's a lot of history to this building. Um, 
goes back to the Metcalf name. Somewhere between the 1460 and 1700s, the Metcalfs moved to Cumbria, over toward the, uh, the west coast. And that's where we can trace, and that's where Bobby Lee actually traced the family back uh, to their own ancestry. And as far back as we can get is 1715. And um, there's some speculation of why they moved there. <coughs> assuming they, presumably it was for, for jobs and to work. And there was a new port going in a place it's called Maryport. And uh, best speculation might be that they moved there to work at the port or to uh, work in the area of the port. So Cumbria is where the story picks up again. Valerie and I uh, were there, we, again, from Bobby Lee, but I'll we'll come to that part of the story. We were there last year, last year, last spring, two years ago, okay, I lose track of you. But this is kind of what it looks like in the area. It's a beautiful, beautiful countryside. So if you go to that area and go back, this is where the first name that we can trace back. Um, and everything I read seems to say that this is back. But then you read the odd thing that says, well, maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. But the best we can come up with is this is kind of how the family comes through. We, we can't find his, his wife's name. But we go down to James, and there's so many Jameses, that's the other confusion, who married an aunt Sawyer. Sawyer. We go down to another James, we can't find his uh, death. And, and Finlandson, <clears throat> so this is where the Finlandson name comes from, I assume. And we can't find her death. They, they moved to Manchester, and uh, that comes to, brings us to James Arthur, who, who's the kind of origin for us in Canada. So, <clears throat> again, um, what we've been able to find out, Simon, who we see, 1715, <clears throat> was a miner. Um, I visited, and I'll show you in a minute, the site where he apparently is buried. There's no stone for him, but that isn't unusual. If he was a miner, it's uh, not likely that there would be a stone for him. But the records suggest that he's, he, we know where he's buried. His son James <clears throat> is listed as a pitman, and uh, Bobby Lee and I were trying to find out what a pitman meant because um, the best we can find is that he's also a miner. Um, and we have where he's buried in Bolton, <clears throat> a place called Brownbrick in Bolton Parish. And then his son, uh, James, lived in a place called Parsons Bridge in Westward Parish. He had five children, and uh, one of those, the youngest, was our great great grandfather, James. So in 2000, I thought it was last year, wasn't it? Last year. Thank you. <laughs> She's always right, almost always. <laughs> Through Bobby Lee, we got in connect, contact with Keith Mailer. Keith is our, I don't know, fifth or sixth cousin. And Keith um, <clears throat> comes from a Robert, who was a brother of James, our great, great, great grandfather. So Keith agreed to meet us in Cumbria, and this is his wife, Janet and uh, toured us for a day around all of these sites. And so the information we got on some of these sites is from Keith, um, who has in, in himself spent a great deal of time researching. And he has an interesting story. He's a motorcycle um, sort of it, um, fanatic. And it, <clears throat> he's now retired, but he belongs to an antique motorcycle club. And um, so Keith, years and years ago, was invited to a rally in Cumbria. And he went, and he hadn't paid much attention to that family history, so I didn't, didn't pay much attention to it, and I hadn't done my research. And he got to Cumbria, and he was biking through this area. And the way he tells the story, he said, I just felt like I was at home in this area. And he started to research, and he's the one that found out that, in fact, our family all came from this area. Um, whether it's true or not true, it's a great story, and, and he feels it. He feels it. For him, going back to Cumbria is very, very special when he goes back regularly. They're a lovely couple. We keep in touch in the email. So Brownbrick, which is we, 75, and I'm a little younger than that, and we toured around and hiked around, and I couldn't keep up to him. He was up and over fences and over snow <laughs> Fantastic condition. But we, we, this was the countryside anywhere where they lived. We know that. 
just can't be sure whether they were owners, tenants, we don't know. This is Bowdoin Prairie. This is, this is Parsons Bridge where James Arthur was born. Right on the bridge. <laughs> visited the church in Bolton Parish where he was baptized and where his parents were married. And there was a wedding dress uh, presentation on it the day. So when you see these flowers and dresses and things, it was because they were presenting this to raise money for charity. And uh, so this is the church where he was baptized, baptized and where he was born. Um, I'm a little out of order. This is where we think Simon is buried, but as I say, there's no stone. Uh, we did find some names, and Keith and I had great fun uh, looking at the stones and saying, gee, I wonder if he was friends with Simon. Maybe they were enemies, maybe they were friends, and we'd make up stories. It was great. <laughs> Another church where we think uh, James, the son of Simon, is buried. Again, he has it from the church records. I didn't check them, but Keith says he has it. So, then, now we go to our James Arthur. Somewhere in his youth, because he was born and baptized in Bolton Parish, they moved to Manchester. And we've lost them in Manchester. We can't seem to find what happened to the family in Manchester. Uh, did they die early? We, we don't know. But we know he moved to Manchester, according to the records. And he worked for his father, who in fact was a builder. James was a builder. He, worked, he went to school there, he worked for his father in Manchester. And then <clears throat> from there, we bring, it brings us to Canada. So he traveled to Canada. I've read at different dates, 1841, 1842. Do you have the, you have some of the, the uh, ship records, but I've not found I haven't been able to refine find this. I haven't found this. I know I've seen them, but I think I have the one where he goes to Australia. That's right. That's the one you're saying. I tried to find this one, and I don't have the patience, but there, there's a lot of, anyway, we knew he came across. Um, he came to, we know he was in Autonomy, which is the Peterborough area. Um, Ellen Housen, our great great grandmother, mm -hmm. was from Peterborough. The Housen family is from Peterborough. And I actually met a great great grandson of, of hers many years ago. <clears throat> we don't know, different things say different, different documents say different things. Did he come from Peterborough straight to Toronto? Did he spend time in Peterborough? I don't know. <coughs> Whoops, pushed the wrong button. So that's just, so <clears throat> he came to Toronto sometime between 1842 and 1849. And the, in 1849 there was a great fire in Toronto. And I'm sorry I'll be a little bit Toronto focused now because that's my home and, and that's where we live. But Toronto King Street, which is a downtown east west street, is a main, was a main street at that time of, uh, of the city's growth. And there was a great fire in, in Toronto in, 18, in 1849. And because of that, there was a great, there was also kind of a, a very strong economy in Toronto. So because of that, there was a building boom that was created and he jumped right in, knocked their opportunist Metcalf and formed a company. I'm not sure you can all read this, but uh, I'll just highlight it. He formed a company called Metcalf, Wilson and Forbes. And Metcalf, Wilson and Forbes became quite a prominent builder in Toronto. And this is a write-up about him. And he built, they built, Knox Presbyterian Church, Jennings Church, St. Lawrence Hall, which built more pictures of the moment, St. James Cathedral, whatever, the mental asylum, he built some of the buildings at the mental asylum. Trinity College, Seventh Post Office, and the Normal School. These were buildings he did between 1847, and, but you can see the majority were after the fire, and the majority of these are on that King Street. Um, area. So it's kind of fun. This building is an old picture of the building that he built. This is the post office. This is a, what I took not too long ago. If any of you followed the Conrad Black story <laughs> and the picture of Conrad Black carrying boxes of files out of his office that got him convicted, that building. He was there, really. <laughs> St. Lawrence Hall is, is fun. I, it's, you know, I, it, I didn't even really realize until I got going on all of this until I took her chain gun cranked up on, on the family. And uh, I walked by this a lot. It's 
a lovely building in Toronto. And if you read the history, you can see that here, it's hard for you to see, but the pictures and drafts. St. Lawrence Hall, which he built, was really the center of Toronto. It was the cultural center of Toronto. There were balls and theater and dance. And, in that time, it was a very famous building. Today, here it is today. It's been restored in 1968. Um, lovely building. It houses a very upscale restaurant now, and a bank and offices up and up. It's a beautiful part of the city. St. James Cathedral. Um, he built that. He built it without the spire. He, he did up to there, and uh, that's one of his. One of my frustrations, and Mary Jane, you may have found it too, in Earl, but in all of these buildings, they record the architect. None of them have recorded the builder, and as Valerie knows, one of my missions is to somehow get that information. So, my question is, was there not an original St. James? Yes. He, and it burnt he, down? It burnt down. Now, was that one he built, or no, did he build this, this one? one? he did. Okay. No, the one before was built. Well, the first one, I think, was... I'll have my date wrong. It was 1812. Or okay. Something like that. All right. And there was another one. Yeah. And that burned down, and then this is the one he did. Okay. Normal school. Um, the building has been torn down, and my son Doug pointed out, and I didn't know this, that the facade, this piece here, has been saved at Ryerson University. So the facade is still there, but the building is gone. Trinity College, um, but that, it's been turned down. It's, what's the name of the park, Andrew? Trinity Bellwood. Bell, Trinity Bellwood Park. It's turned into a park now. There was some speculation in one document that this was the gate from his house. Well, it's not. It's a gate thing that was from Trinity College, but not from, from the house. So James married Allen House in Peterborough. Most of you have seen these pictures. He had two children, Agnes Ann, who uh, lived only about a year and a half, and James Finlayson, our great grandfather. Um, there was, there, the records suggest an adopted son named George, and uh, he was born in 1854. We don't know much about him, but Earl remembers him. Don't you? you, you well, yes, we often wondered how George fitted in, yeah. because uh, he was older than our grandfather, but he lived with grandmother and grandfather all the time. But none of us could figure out where George really belonged. It's interesting how the family doesn't talk about these no. things. They don't tell you. So he was yeah. part of this family. He was an adopted son. The best I can find, he was an adopted son of James and Ellen. And in the census records, you see his in there in the census. And that's that's the best that we can track down. He was adopted. He was always around when we were kids. So I, we don't know much about him. What's the name Finlinson? Finlinson, remember back there was a, an Ann Finlinson oh, okay. that was that was married to a James? Okay. That's where the name comes from. Okay. We don't know much about George. I'd like to know more about him. I put this in just because he was building on King Street a little bit before this. But it shows what life must have been like then. And the, the, and the social life. Obviously, it's a very nice picture. It was King Street. Christmas in 1853. Earl was saying earlier about um, our grandfather picking up and moving Essex for a bit with the family. Well, can you imagine James Ellen and young James Finlinson picking up? Because in, in 1852, Metcalf Forbes, Wilson Forbes went bankrupt. And um, I don't know why, other than they say they were overextended and went bankrupt. Um, he picked up everybody, headed to the gold rush in Melbourne, Australia. But if you've done some reading about what life was like in 1850, he didn't pop on Air Canada. <laughs> it was a trek. How did he get to California? Well, not the train didn't exist. Maybe parts of it in the United States. He had to get to California, and he had to get from California to Melbourne on a sailing ship. There's no other way to do it. Amazing. He went to Melbourne, and uh, as some of the literature says, he convinced the powers that be that he could redo what he had done in Toronto for them in Melbourne, and he did. And there's some great write-ups about a couple of his buildings 
and openings and James Metcalf the builder and it's been fantastic stuff. Anyway, these are some of the things you involved in. This is a facade of one of his buildings. It's been saved in the Commerce Building at the University of Melbourne, I think. Um, but it's not the original building, but they saved the facade. <laughs> Is there, um, is there still a Bedford Park it's Road? Bedford, it's Bedford Park. It's, there it's still is one. Because I, yeah. I went looking once, uh, from, it was between St. Clair and... and it's North Lawrence. Yeah. And I couldn't, I know there's a little it's park. North Lawrence, it's, it's North of Lawrence and um, West of Young. It's kind of, a, there's a little dip in the road and there's a park on the, run, the right side. I still couldn't find Bedford Park Road or... Oh, that's, oh. that's right. Um, I don't know if there's a road. Oh, okay. That was the area. He had 200 acres. Built his estate. There's lots of colorful pictures about what he did and how the estate was. Um, I'm sorry that the pictures don't show there, but it's in the book. Uh oh. No. Oh. This is my highlight. Oh, this is. Mary Jane has a picture that I've been looking for for two years, and she has it, and God bless you, because it just made me almost cry when we found it. But I have another picture, which is going to be on the screen. I'm going to have to do it this way. Um, in 1820, on Bloor Street, at the site of Jane's home, there was a place called the Wigwam, and this is it. And I can pass it around for you. And I want to read what it says. Where the elegant Park Plaza Hotel now stands, there was once a little one-story log cabin known as the Tecumseh Wigwam. Built in 1820, it continued to be a popular drinking establishment until 1864. Especially on Sundays, the Wigwam was a favorite resort of young men of elevated social status and habits. In the 1850s, it was maintained by an old man named King, whose son George was a member of the notorious band of robbers known as the Townsend Gang. Son George was convicted of murder for a stagecoach driver and hanged in Cayuga. From documents I've been able to read and I lost track of now, R. James bought this property, tore it down, and built the house that Mary Jane has the picture of. So this is the, Bloor, this is the first Bloor Street house, and I really am sorry that it didn't show up. That was great. Happy to find that. And just as evidence that it was there, this is an early map in the Bobby Lee Town Forest. This is in 1890. I've got an earlier one, but the one I had in it has Mrs. E. Metcalf. That's where the house is. 
if you know Toronto, Avenue Road, Bluer. So that was the house. This house was owned by a fellow named Nordheimer, who was a famous piano maker. Yeah. The Nordheimer family. That was their house. And I have a picture of that. And now, they have a picture. <laughs> and I just put this up. And you can't read very well. That's Mrs. Metcalf. There is an earlier one that says Mr. James Metcalf. But this is the one they had. These streets, Prince Arthur and Lowther, he developed. He, he developed these streets, he, he put the lots in, and he started selling, uh, selling properties. But he moved to, he moved to Bloor Street after there was a fire at Nottolo, and he moved to this address. Um, Is that before he went into politics? That was before he went into politics. Okay. He may have been in, before he was elected anyway. And these are the pictures I had of now Mary Jane scooped me. <laughs> This is the corner of Bloor and, and Avenue Road. That's the Nordheimer house here. This is Bloor looking west. And that was a house that I have a picture of on that street, but his must have been in there. It was it here or here somewhere? So now we have the house. So what have we got from the house? We know we have the window. This fellow has the window. I have this book and I've brought it, and it's here for, and it has a write up of James, and it's an 1880 who's who book. Very, it's, it's, it is 1880, so it's 134 years old, so if you look at it, please do it carefully. I've got his page mark. This is a chair that, that my father gave to, um, had, I guess, and gave to my brother Jerry, our brother, apparently. Jerry, and that's a picture of that. Should take it on to Antiques Roadshow, Mike, and uh, find out what it's worth. There's a table that my dad gave to me, and dad actually built, rebuilt one of the spindles here um, that had fallen off. And he said it was from the, the Toronto house. And I, I was never sure because it looked very much like a, what I call it, what you call it, Jason Hayes design, which is a kind of a 1900 design. But Valerie and I were touring forget where, a building, an older building, and they had a, a piece of furniture in it that had exactly the same design since we asked them. And, and they got out a book and they, it was 18, sort of 1860s design. So I'm convinced that it is in fact from the original house. Oops. Now, Earl, just, whoops, I wanted to say something. Uh, is there more? And Earl this morning showed that there's more because you've got some of our grandfather's artifacts and you brought them today. Yeah. I don't know if there's other pieces around in the family, but if there are, it would be great to get What about the pier glass that was to do with 